Hi, and welcome to Wired Lotus's YouTube channel. Today we have a super fun project for you today. What we're going to do is we're going to show you how to make this embossed cicada wing and copper uh, that was created out of using this actual cicada wing that you see here. This is the spent cicada wing that we used in our project here today. So what we're going to do is we're going to show you not only how to emboss uh, that cicada wing, we're going to show you how to make the fringe, we're going to show you how to make the circle component, we're going to show you a little wire wrapping, we're going to show you how to create this necklace, and let me show you the back. And in the back, we're going to show you how to make these components, how we're going to actually make this chain little uh, fob here at the end that says fly because who doesn't want to see fly with a cicada wing and how to attach our little amethyst on the back. So this right here, this project is all encompassing. It's a very thorough, very um, uh, a beautiful project that we're gonna be working on here today. So thank you so much for joining me and um, please subscribe and like this uh, video if you found it of value. I'm glad that you're here. The first thing we're gonna need, of course, is a cicada wing. And um, I collect my cicada wings by um, after they the season's over and they fall to the ground and they've already perished, I pick up the cicadas and then I release their wings using a pair of scissors, just a small pointed pair of scissors, and then I just take them off and discard the bodies. Typically, by the time I get them, the birds have already um, done away with the main body of the insect. So when you release these wings, you'll have four wings. You'll have two inner wings and two outer wings if the, um, if the uh, bug is intact. Um, so the first thing that we're gonna do is we're going to take our cicada wing and we're going to just put it up against a piece of 20 gauge copper. I like copper because it's just a little bit softer than the silver, especially when we anneal it. So I'm going to take it and I'm going to cut that piece of 20 gauge copper with a little pair of um, shears. That's all I do. And if you wanted to use a saw, you could use a saw. After that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that small piece of copper and I'm going to anneal it. Here's a video on how I did that. When we begin by annealing, what we want to do is we want to turn on our torch. And our goal is to see the metal kind of relax. And we're also looking to see that that metal is also turning kind of a light orange or just starts to turn. That's when we know when we're annealed. Now we're going to take our annealed piece of copper. We're going to place our cicada wing right on there. And we're going to put that on a bench block. This is a fairly thick steel bench block. We're going to put that on there. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a couple of pieces of just, this is just, you know, your traditional packing tape that we have here. And it, this one is clear. And I'm going to take that and I'm going to put that right over the cicada wing and the copper. What that does is that holds that there in place so that when I hammer, it maintains its integrity. So I wanna make sure that I do that. So it just kind of looks like that. There we go. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut a little piece of foam right here. I have just a sheet of foam. It's just craft foam and you can find that in your hobby store. And I'm going to take that piece of foam and I'm going to cut a piece just about the same size here as my copper. I'm going to put that over there and then what I'm going to do is vigorously hammer it. But before I do that, I'm going to put another piece of tape on there just to hold the foam in place. I also like to tab out my tape so that when I'm done, I can just take the tab and just pull it through. Okay, so I have a slightly domed hammer here and I'm going to take that hammer and I'm just going to pound. Now, the fact that the metal has been annealed is going to render it soft enough so that that cicada wing will fall down into that metal and will create an impression. Now, just keep in mind that when you do this, the impression is going to be very, very light. It doesn't take a really sharp impression. As a matter of fact, let me show you something. 
In my book, Inventive Wire Weaving, I um, created a chapter on cicada wings. And this right here is the finished product. Of course, we're not going to be doing this because this is uh, far too involved. We're going to stay mainstream with what we're doing here. So what I've done here is I have shown you here how that looks on the silver. As you can see, that impression is not very dark at all. And then what we do is we, um, I show you right here, how we just take that and we just put a little bit of patina on it and then we cut around it, which we're going to be doing in these next steps. So, but before we do that, what we're going to do next is we're going to go ahead and we're gonna hammer. Here we go. leaving the bottom layer in case I need to um, compress some more. Okay, I'm just going to take a look here. It looks like it did a pretty good job. Let's go ahead, if you take a look here, you can kind of see that impression. I'm going to go ahead and take that off. I'm just going to give it a few more thwacks here, and then we're gonna pull it off and we're gonna take a look at our image. Let's go ahead and take it off and let's see what we got. Again, this is going to be a very faint image. We're not going to get anything too bold here. Okay, this is what we have. We have our image here. As you see, it's nice and faint, but it's there. And that's what we're that's what we're gunning for is that is that slight image that's there. I'm gonna draw. I mean, I've just drawn with sharpie over the entire piece here, and what that's going to do is that's going to get right there in the grooves and crevices. We want to bring out that pattern of the cicada as much as we possibly can. So that's what we're looking to do is to just kind of bring that out. Now I need to let that dry. I want to say maybe, I like to give it maybe about five minutes. Sharpie doesn't take very long to dry, but we're going to go ahead and we're going to let that dry. And then we're going to go ahead and we are going to sand that off with our sandy paper. Once that's dry, we're going to bring in our sandy paper, the P3, P320 sanding film by 3M is what I use here. So the reason I like it is because it um, it is a very, very nice light grit to it. And I don't want anything that's going to be too harsh on this because what we're going to do is we're going to be working against the grain here. We want that to come out. We don't want that to be a very strong sanding paper. So I'm just going to just sand it down just a little bit. You can see now that that sh pattern is starting to evolve. Again, don't go crazy with your sanding paper here. You don't want that to happen. Okay, and you want to go uh, you want to go against that green. You don't want to go with the green because you don't want to take that out of the grooves. Now, what I'm doing is just sanding a little bit more vigorously around the piece. Okay, I'm going to go again here. Just around the piece, a little more vigorously. You're just creating that contrast by sanding around the piece like this. Getting all of that Sharpie, getting um, the um, suit erased here from the um, torch that you used. And also the other thing about making this outer edge bright is that it will um, help to enhance that um, pattern that we have on the bug wing.
No more. We're not going to sand any more right on that bug wing. As I'm doing this, I'm following the shape of the cicada wing coming around and just following the shape. That just gives it some um, dimension. Now that we've done our sanding, we're going to come in here with our 3M polishing papers and we're just going to refine those edges there just a little bit more just to kind of bring out that highlight allow that just to really shine because we really want that to be very contrasty so that will actually help our wing shape and the embossing parts of the wing to really stand out i'm going to come in with um, the next grit here which is kind of that gray color just kind of that gray color and I'm going to come in and I'm just going to sand that down or polish. It's not really sanding it, they're polishing cloths, but they are impregnated with a grit to them. And I can make this as shiny as I want to with this, but I don't, I, I really kind of like that rough hewn look. So we're just going to go ahead and we're going to stop here. The cicada wing now has been taped down to my bench block. Again, I've tabbed it out so it's easier to pull off. Now I have um, an oval shape right here is what I have. And I'm going to be using the 1 3 force, And this is the ellipse guide here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to place that here. Now, you don't have to have this exact oval guide. You can create any shape you want. You can even do this freehand. I'm taking a scribe, and that just has a really nice point to it. I'm just going to pan out here a little bit, and I'm going to take that really sharp end of the scribe, and I'm going to bring it around, going around all the way. And then we're going to go ahead and we're going to cut that with the shears. I do like to leave a little bit of, a, of an edge here. We're going to be putting a hole up here, so we need to make sure that we have enough room here up top for a hole. So I'm placing two hands on either side here. I'm eyeballing this. I'm not measuring it. If you felt like you wanted to measure that, you could sure do that, but I'm not going to. I'm just holding on here with both sides and I'm just going to just create a line all the way around the cicada wing. This is so I know exactly where to cut. If I were to bring a Sharpie, and if I were to do this with a Sharpie, I run the risk of that coming over here to the edge and I work so hard to get that polished. So maybe you can or can't take a look. Let me just zoom up and see if you can see where I've created that line. There's that line and that's gonna be the cutting line. So let's go ahead and take this off and let's go, let's go ahead and cut. I'm going to be using uh, metal shears and um, these are very basic metal shears. If you wanted to, you could use uh, Joyce Chin shears. There, it takes a little bit more um, uh, pressure to be using that here on this 20 gauge. So let's just go ahead and use the metal shears for this too. You, if you also, if you wanted to be more precise, you can use your um, jeweler saw. But I realize not everybody has a jeweler saw, so I'm trying to keep this as easy as possible. So we're just going to go around and we're just going to cut exactly where I have right on that line that I've created with the scribe. And here we have our rudimentary shape all cut out. I want to be careful that I don't hold this too much in the center because if I do, what I'm going to find will happen is that I, it will erase that pattern. We don't want that to happen. So what we're going to do is we're going to come in and we're just going to just file all the way around the edges and we're just refining that shape, taking off some of those little cut edges, making things look a little bit smoother. You could use just a commercial fingernail file and start on the coarse side and then go over to um, the side that is more fine. Again, this just refines the edges a little bit more. You're gonna do that all the way around the piece. 
So here our piece has been filed and it's been sanded. Once all of our um, filing and sanding is done, what we're going to do is we're going to put a, just a small coat of this microcrystalline wax polish here on the um, actual impression. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of place this um, uh, polish right in there. And what I'm doing is I'm just laying it down in there and I'm just kind of doing like this. Just kind of just pressing it in there just a little bit. And again, what this will do is this will protect that surface and it will protect our embossing to look just, you know, keep it looking nice. And we're putting this all over. Again, not rubbing, just kind of placing it. All right, I actually gave that about a half hour to dry. Um, I assessed it after about 10 minutes and it was still wet. Now, how do you know when it's dry? How do you know it's ready for the next step? That's if you take a look at it and you just kind of move it around in the light. If it has kind of a dull look to it, then it's ready for the next step. That being that we're going to take our eyeglass cloth again, and we're just going to just rub that off a little bit, not much. We want to make sure that we preserve that Renaissance wax right there in the grooves or that embossed area. Okay, that's what we're wanting to do. Then what we're going to do is we're going to put another coat of wax on there again. So I'm going to take my glass cloth. It's just eyeglass tissue, I guess you could say it is. And since we already have one coat on, we don't need to be as careful this time. So this time we're just going to a very light coat on here. Very light. And you're going to be doing this a total of three times. You're going to be putting the wax on, wait in about a half hour for it to dry, and then what you're going to do is you're going to make sure it's dull. If it's dull, then you can just polish it, and then you're going to put the next coat on for a total of three coats. So that in total would be about an hour and a half of waiting for that to um, be fully coated with three coats of the um, Ren Wax. Again, that's this, this is what it looks like here. Okay. Let's wait for that and we'll go on to the next Here step. we have five centimeters, six lengths of 18 gauge wire. What we're going to do next is we're going to ball this wire up and then we're going to quench it. We're going to do that using our butane torch here. And uh, that's something that we're just going to do pretty quickly. I'm going to show you that. We're going to go ahead and we're going to create a ball here on the end here. We're just going to use our torch. to shut off our torch and then we're just going to just assess and just make sure that that looks good and then we're going to quench that okay that's all we need to do what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how I did this right here what we're going to need for that was we're going to need a steel bench block we're going to need our hammer we're going to need um, some more of our sanding film and then we're going to need our two polishing cloths that we had previously used. Okay, so what we're going to do is I did not pickle this, meaning that I did not take the oxidation off because we're going to be doing some sanding here. So I didn't take that extra step to do that. So what we're going to do here is we're just going to place this here on the bench block. And I'm going to try to just hit that, um, that bald area that we created. Now, if I wanted to be you know, a little bit more careful. I could do it here on the end. And what that's going to do is that's just going to allow me not to hit the actual wire. I only want to be hitting the ball that I just made. And I'm just going to assess it. I'm going to see if that's about how I would like it. And that looks pretty good there. So what we're going to do, and we're going to be doing this with all six pieces. I'm going to be bringing in my sanding film here. The shining side is the side we don't want to use. And we're just going to bring that in here and we're just going to sand that off. Now, again, I'm kind of going for a little bit of that grungy look. So um, I'm okay with it being a little bit rough looking. Um, also, uh, just keep in mind that you can do a flame patina on these. And what, that's what I'm hoping to do is just leave a little bit of that patina on there, especially in those crevices to give it kind of that old world look, which is what I like to do. 
So there we have that first sanding. So now what we're gonna do, actually right here, if you look, I don't know if you can see that or not, it's a little bit yellow right in there. So we wanna make sure, one thing I do like to do is I do like to make sure I get all the yellow off of my silver. I don't care for that look. And that's just oxidation due to the fire. Now we're going to bring in our green or our number one sanding film here or our polishing film paper. We're gonna bring it in. We're just gonna just polish it up a little bit. And I'm gonna just twist that wire around a little bit. I'm gonna make sure I get that, especially on those little bald areas. Let me just kind of come in a little bit more and we'll just hit it with the next one, which is the gray one. And we're just going to do the same thing. This again, is just a little bit of a finer polishing cloth here. And we're just hitting it there. And then we're gonna turn it, we're gonna hit the other side. And then I'm just gonna kind of get right along that shaft of that, okay? And then I'm going to flip it over and I'm going to do the same here with the green. And then do the same here with the gray. And there we have our finished piece. So now we have two pieces here and we just have and we just have four more to go. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna ball up either end of 16 gauge wire. This is, I cut this to a total of um, 11 centimeters. That's before I ball it. Let's go ahead and shut off our torch and then we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna quench either end of that. I noticed that when I torched that, that it just kind of got a little bit of a funny ball there, but let's see if we can work with that because I hate to um, waste this uh, 16 gauge length. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to take this and I'm just going to hammer on either end of this. Again, we're gonna work with that funky end there and we're gonna create a ball much the same way that we created a ball with the, um, little fringe pins. I think we're going to be able to work with that. You're going to see how I'm going to work with that. And then I'm going to just flip it over to the other side. Now, when I flip it over to the other side, we want these to be on the same plane. So in other words, this is flat over here. We want this side here to be flat too. So we're going to go ahead and we're just going to hammer that nice and flat. take a look at that that looks pretty good so what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in here with my file and I'm just going to file off that little nub there I can also um, subsequently I could also cut it off with um, my shears let's see why don't I go just go ahead and do that because otherwise I'm going to be here filing for a while so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to cut up that nub there with some shears and I'm going to then take my file and I'm going to go just go ahead and I'm going to file around that little area that I cut just to kind of round that off a little bit. All right, see, there we go. And now it looks good. So now what we need to do is we need to go ahead and we need to sand this and make that look a little bit more bright. So let's go ahead and do that. I have a three quarter inch dowel rod here and I'm going to take that 16 gauge wire and I'm going to form it around the dowel rod so that these two little um, circles pass each other, just like two cars passing each other on a road. So we're just gonna go on either side. We're trying to keep those two circles so that they're right on the same plane like you see here. And we're just going to bring that, let me just bring this down over here. You're just gonna bring that down and around and you're forming it. And you want to continue forming those as much as you can by pushing those ends down. All right, so they're just going down like that. So they're just passing each other. Super, super cool. Love that. Look, now, 
what we need to do at this point is we need to secure this. And the best way to secure this is just with a little length of wire. I'm not going to give you the exact measurement on the 24 gauge, but let's just maybe say about, I would say about, you'd be safe with going about 10 centimeters. So what we're gonna do is start here in the middle, okay? And then we're just going to start wrapping around here. We're just wrapping that around. I'm holding this wire here in between my fingers here like this. That helps to stabilize it. And I should have done that to begin with. Holding on here with these two wires. And now I'm going to go up and around. And now I'm going to finish out my coil with on top of both wires making sure that my coils are as close as possible. I may need to push them in with my fingernails or a tool. If you don't have fingernails, I realize not everybody does have fingernails. And we're just going up and around until we just about run out of space here with our wire. Now we're just going to push that in a little bit and we're going to finish out our coiling on this side. push them in further. Another coil. And I'm just pushing. I'm compressing these coils as much as I can. And then when I get to the point where I just absolutely can't put another coil in, I'm going to bring my wire up and around and coil once around each side near the, um, near the ball that I've hammered. Now this one here is a little bit tricky because I didn't leave enough tail. So what I need to do is I need to hold on here to that wire using my um, pliers. So I'm bringing my pliers in. I've just brought it around once and I'm just, just moving it around and I'm bringing it around again. Okay, and that locks that in. The main point is that I lock that in. Now we can go ahead and we can cut our wire ends here and cut that towards the back so that you can't see that. I really, my favorite my favorite wire cutters are these Tronics razor cuts, and um, they have worked really well for me in the past. And I'm going to create my cut, and then I'm going to bring my pliers in, and I'm going to tuck that end in. I don't want that to get caught and any one sweater, we wanna keep those sharp ends in and tucked away. And I'm going to do the same on the other side. So now what I need to do is I need to create a hole up at the top here for my um, skeeto wing to dangle off of my loop. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a look and I'm going to decide which end I want to do that. And invariably, it seems like I always choose this as my top part. So I think I'm going to continue to follow suit. What I'm going to do is put a little mark there where I want that to be with my Sharpie. And I'm going to make sure that I'm not too far in towards the um, uh, wing. I want to make sure that I'm for a little bit further out, about right there. But I also don't want to make it too close to the edge because if I make it too close to the edge, then I'm gonna blow through the edge and I don't want that to happen. So um, I'm going to bring in these, um, these are well-worn, well-worn um, hole punches. And this right here is 1.25 millimeters. And what I'm going to do is bring in that punch right there where I, I put that mark, I'm putting the punch right there. If you can see that, the, there you go, it's right there. So I'm gonna go ahead and give it a good squeeze. Since this is 20, um, 20 gauge sheet, it's going to be a little bit tougher to get through, but we got through and it worked out perfectly. So here we have our three millimeter jump ring. We're bringing a plier in to either side here of that jump ring and we're opening it up front to back that's what we're doing front to back i'll show that to you again 
I'll show it to you from this angle. Here it's closed, front to back. And then we're going to bring that here into our um, hole that we just made for our cicada. All right, and that fits perfectly with our 18 gauge jump ring. And now we're going to take that and we're going to put all of that here on our um, ring. Now, one thing we need to notice, and I didn't notice, is this right here, I labeled it to decide which is my front and which is my back. I think I have my cuts on the back, so I'm gonna make sure this is on the front. So we need to make sure we put the cicada wing on the front, and then we're gonna grasp hold of our jump ring on either side here, and we're just gonna wiggle it closed until we see those ends co-opting on the ring. Make sure that they look nice and tight there. Sometimes I can feel them scraping together. There we go. They're nice, that's nice and tight. So let me show you what that looks like now. So what we have looks like this now. I'll give you a little bird's eye view here. There we go. So this is what we have so far. This is just super cool. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna work on our fringe on the left and we're gonna work on our fringe on the right. Okay, now let's work on our fringe. The first thing that I have to do is I have to hold all my fringe pieces up against a flat surface. And I take a look to see if there's one that's shorter than the other. If there is, then that's the one we're gonna compare all the others to. We want these all to be the same length. Invariably, there's gonna be one that's gonna be shorter. So what I'm doing is I'm bringing my cutters in and I'm going to make each one of these the same size as the shortest one. And um, if, if it's, you know, just about that size, that's good. If it's off a little bit, let's not sweat it. Let's just have fun with this, okay? Okay, so now they're all about the same size at this point. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna come in with um, two pliers here, and we're going to work hard in these a little bit. We don't want these to bend when somebody's wearing them, including ourselves. So what we're gonna do to work hard in this a little bit is I'm gonna hold this with one flat nose pliers, and then I have a needle nose pliers here like this. And I'm gonna do two things. First thing I'm gonna do is pull. I'm pulling these out, pulling, and then I'm twisting one time. And what that will do is that will render that a lot harder than I had it before. See, what we did is we actually were annealing those when we um, torched the uh, little balls there. So let's do that again, holding on here to the end, holding on here with the other end, pulling, and give it one twist while we're pulling. And that's hardened. So we're gonna do that with all of these. Now we're going to come in with our bail making pliers. I am going to bring this in and when I make a loop, and that's what we're gonna do with all these, is we're going to make a loop. Now what I'm going to do is I'm gonna use the larger barrel here and I'm going to stabilize this whole piece here and I'm just going to turn my wrist. I'm just turning my wrist with this. And then I'm going to readjust and I'm going to turn my wrist again until that, I'm gonna show you here until that meets. Once it meets there, we're done. Showing you what that looks like. So your loop is gonna be going that way and your circle is going to be going the other way. If it's not, which this is a little bit off, what you're going to do is you're going to hold on to the loop with one side, you're going to bring your pliers in to the other side and you're gonna turn it until it is, you've got the loop going back and you get your circle going this way. So loops that way, circle this way. Okay, you're gonna do that on all six of your pieces. Now we have all six pieces with our loops on. Now what we're going to do is we're going to put our loops on either side here of the cicada. So in order to do that, we have to reopen our loops, just the same way that we opened up our jump ring. So we're gonna hold on to one side of our loop and we're gonna grasp onto it to the other side and we're going to pull it out. And then we're going to put this on our ring and then we're going to close it the opposite direction. So I'm bringing in 
my pliers here. I've got my other pliers here. And I'm going to just grab hold of it and I'm going to bring it down. So there I have my first fringe. There's my first fringe. Let's go ahead and do our other fringes. Let me show you the next fringe a little bit more up close so that you get a really good feel for how to open that up. So I'm bringing my pliers in here, bringing the tips of my other plier in here, and I'm opening that up from front to back. And now I'm going to bring this here on my ring. I'm going to put it on my ring and just let my ring fall. My concentration is on the loop. And also, let me just show you one other way. I'm just taking my finger, supporting it there, and I'm just bringing my loop down. And that actually might be better because it's really tough to get in there with your um, pliers. So let's go ahead and put our other fringes on. So here we have our fringes complete. But one thing I'm noticing is that when I prepared this design, I wasn't thinking about this fringe obscuring the front the way that it's doing. So I think what I'd like to do is I'd like to cut these inner pieces of fringe a little bit shorter and maybe even the next one. So let's go ahead and remove four of the fringes and let's create this um, so that we can see more of the cicada wing. Now you may say, hey, I kind of like the way that looks and maybe when you wear it, it that fringe kind of falls over to the side. But you know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking I really want to go ahead and just uh, cut down those four in the middle. So let's go ahead and do that. To do that, what we're going to do is we're going to pull out two of these and we're going to remove these four the way that we put them on. So we're just like a jump ring. We're going to take them and we're going to open them up and we're going to remove them. So removing the inner four is what we're going to do at this point. Okay, so don't worry. It looks like now that the outer ones are the inner ones, but the outer ones are still the outer ones. We're just going to put the inner ones on the inside here. So what we're gonna do at this point, we need to make sure that everything is the same size. That's critical. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna create the smaller ones in the center. I'm going to stand these up just so that they are the same height. I need to make sure that I cut these exactly the same. So what I'm doing is I'm holding them here on the table and then it doesn't really matter what size I cut them. I do wanna cut with the flush side or the flat side of my cutters um, uh, towards the um, ball or towards a circle. And now I'm gonna hold that first one that I cut because it is going to be the, um, it's gonna be the template for the other one. So now I'm going to come in and I'm going to cut the other one. So now those are that size. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to use the one that I just cut as a template because I want the second, this other one to be even shorter. Let me flip that around. So the balls are going on the table and I'm going to cut this one here shorter, a little bit shorter, about like that. Okay, so, and you can decide how long you wanna cut it. That's more of an aesthetic thing. Now I'm bringing the other one that I haven't cut in. I'm gonna hold them both flat on the table with the balls touching the table. And I'm going to bring my cutters in and I'm going to cut. There we have it. So now what we have is these are going to be now our inner pieces here. And these are going to be our outer pieces and these are gonna be our outermost pieces. So let's go ahead and recreate our loops in there with our little um, bail pliers. All right, now we have those all, all those loops created. Now we're gonna open them up and we're going to put these on. Remember these are our longer ones and these are our shorter ones. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and we're going to open our loops of the um, longer ones first, open it up, and we're gonna put this on. And again, I wanna just show you, I'm putting this on so that this loop is looped onto the back, towards the back, 
Okay, that's what we're got. That's what we're aiming for. It's just opening up, and I didn't open that one up enough. That one needs to be opened up just a little bit more. There we go. And we're going to just so this right here is our our ball, and this right here is the loop. I'm going to hold this one out of the way, and we're just going to go ahead and we're just going to push this in here. Now we can go ahead and we can close that. I'm going to close that loop. So this is the longer of the two that we just cut. I want to make sure that that loop is fully closed there. I'm going to come in with the other longer one. Open it up. And I'm going to put this on the other side, holding back this other one. This right here is where my loop is, right here, or that circle is. And I'm just hooking it on there, just like that. Already, I'm liking this so much better, so much better. Now we're gonna go with the shorter pieces. I bet, I bet there's a lot of you that feel the same way. Okay, so here we go. We're going to bring our loop, bring it forward. You know, this is all part of design and composition of a piece, is realizing when you, you know, need to make adjustments. I would say probably about 80% of the time, what I envision a piece looking like, or what I plan it, or even draw it out, it looks different than what the finished piece, the finished piece looks like. And this is our last piece. I'm holding back these other two, going back to the other side, hooking it on, and we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna close that. Now we're going to take a look and see what this looks like now that we have the shorter pieces done. Extra cool. It almost looks kind of, you know, accentuates that kind of bugginess. Love, 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 love that. Love how that's going to swing. Love that movement of that. Super duper cool. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to create the necklace for this. Now we're going to attach our cord. What we have here is we have two lengths of either 14 inches to 15 inches of, I use three millimeter flat um, faux suede is what I use. And then I fold this in half. So we're gonna fold that in half, making sure that our edges here are together. That's really important part of this part of the tutorial. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to Look at the front of my piece. I'm going to put that loop through the ring, and then I'm going to bring these ends through the loop that I just made, okay? And I'm going to start to cinch that. Before I get all the way with cinching this, I need to make sure that my ends here are even. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold those together, making sure that my um, cord is not crossed over, and while these are perfectly aligned here at the end, and then I'm going to give a tug. I'm going to tug it even further, a little bit up towards the top, so that we have a nice cord there. We're going to do the same on the other side. We're going to fold our cord in half, making sure that there's no crossing over of the cord. We're going to put that loop through the ring. And then we're going to take our cords ends and we're going to put that through the loop. I believe this is called a half hitch knot. And what I'm going to do again, make sure that these are aligned, hold them together one on top of the other, give them a good pinch, make sure that our cords not twisted, looks good. And I'm going to tug just going to make sure that those are aligned up top. If you're off just by a small amount, there should be enough give in the cord that you can just pull on the side that's a little bit shorter. That should be fine. Okay, the next thing that we're going to do, we need to create a platform here on the end so that we can secure this so that we can put our clasp on. 
to do that, the first thing that we're going to need is we're going to need to create a couple of components. Let's go ahead and look at those components right now. The first is that we're going to create what I call a D-ring. And what we do is we take a soldered closed jump ring that's 10 millimeters, and we're going to actually create our D-ring. In order to do that, we're going to take a pair of flat nose pliers. This is not your needle nose or your chain nose pliers. It is a nice blunt tip to it. And I'm going to come in and just like with this one here, I'm going to just compress that flat on one side. So what we're going to do, I like to do that on the solder line so that that's not um, going to be sightly. I'm going to go down to down a little bit and I'm just going to just create that flat portion and I'm just squeezing right where that solder join is just squeezing I want to the goal is just to flatten this out and you'll see why here in just a minute so I'm just flattening that out we don't want to open up that solder line, so there we go. Let's just take a look and see if these are fairly even. Yep, those are pretty good. Now what we want to do is we want to just flatten that area that we just compressed a little bit. And the way that we do that is we just use um, a, a hammer, a chasing hammer. And we're, I like to make sure that I hold on to this with something other than my fingers. Otherwise, it's um, I run the risk of hurting my fingers. So I'm just flattening that out. I might inadvertently flatten out the sides. That's okay. I think maybe we should go just a little bit more. I need to make sure I get a little bit of those corners too. I think that's gonna be good. If I need to, I can come back in and I can just squeeze this a little more flat. As I'm squeezing, I might wanna hold this at this parallel angle to make sure that that's nice. The next component is going to be what I what I call the platform for the um, chain and what I've done here is I've taken this is 26 gauge sterling silver and I made a line going here you want that width to be a half of a centimeter so you're looking for that to be a half of a centimeter and then the length to be four centimeters just right there at the four centimeter mark. Then you're going to mark a dotted line on the first centimeter, a straight solid line on the second, on the third, another dotted line. And finally, you're going to do a straight line. And let me tell you why you're gonna do that. You're doing that because you want to be able to create a fold and you want to be able to ascertain where the fold is and where the cut line is. Now, before I did that measurement, I sanded that a little bit. And the reason why we do that is because we're going to be applying glue. And then when we apply glue, we need to make sure that there's a little bit of tooth to the metal so that glue doesn't just slide away. So what we're going to do is we're going to bring in our shears and we're going to go ahead and we're going to cut on all of those solid lines. There we go. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to cut a middle solid line. And remember those other lines are just fold lines. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're going to bring our piece of metal in and we're gonna double check to make sure that it clears that straight part on the D-ring. That clears, let's just make sure that clears, and that clears too. 
So we're good to go there. So what we're going to do next is we're going to, where we created those fold line marks, we're going to bring in our flat nose pliers. It's not a chain nose pliers, it's nice and flat, blunted, and we want that to rest right there on that fold line. And it's actually just slightly below that fold line because you have your pliers that's going to consume some of that space as you see here. Okay, and then we're just gonna fold that. I'm going to back up my pliers just a little bit once I begin that fold, and I'm going to just a little bit. And I'm going to continue folding, continue folding. As you see, it's just creating kind of this fold. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in my D-ring and I'm going to put that in there. The glue I use is two-part epoxy. And uh, the reason why I like that is because it seems to really hold. Two-part epoxy just is what it says it is. I pull off the cap. I'm going to bring in my glue. I'm going to just come at this angle so you can really see what I'm doing here. And I'm just going to squeeze this plunger so that I have equal parts of um, the glue that comes out. Now, if you notice this one here, it's coming out a little faster than that one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to really muscle the other side so that I get equal parts. When we first start mixing epoxy, it looks a little bit on the cloudy side. As you see, when it's ready, it'll be more clear. And our two-part epoxy is ready. It's nice and clear at this point. What we're going to do now is we're going to take some of that epoxy and we're going to place it on either side inside of our little component here that we just made. You don't want to overdo it. You're just putting just enough in so that just adds a little additional security to the piece. I'm going to make sure it goes all the way down into the component. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to bring our necklace in. And I'm going to make sure that these are very straight. And then we're going to put one on top of the other. Lining these up so that they're right on top of each other is critical to this step. Once we're there, we're going to take this and we're going to put it right in that metal. We're just setting it in there, making sure it's lined up, and then we're going to, with our fingers, we're going to press down on the metal. And then we're going to further press down with our pliers towards the front. I don't want to press from the back forward because otherwise it's going to push out our cord. I'm pushing from the front and then I'm going to go to the back. And then I'm going to come in at an angle and I'm going to squeeze further. And then I'm going to squeeze further on the other angle. Very important that these remain aligned. And then we're going to do the same on the other side. Right now, this is what this looks like. You can see it already taking shape. Let's go ahead and do that to the other side. Let's prepare for riveting. What we're going to need for riveting is we're going to need our wire, which I'm going to be using 16 gauge sterling silver wire. I'm going to be using a riveting hammer here and I'm going to be using a, um, a, a bead reamer or a round diamond file and a 1.25 hole punch. Um, before we begin with our riveting, we glued that uh, inside component there, but we need to make sure that that glue is dry. And the way that I um, ascertain whether or not that glue is dry is by taking a look at the little pod of, of uh, glue that I mixed up. And if it's stiff and if it's dry, I can't get that um, uh, toothpick out of there, then I know I'm good to go. So we can go ahead and we can begin with our riveting. Okay, we've got a little mark there. That is where we are going to punch the hole, is right there. 
We could go up even further. Actually, let's let's go up just a little bit further with that mark. Just a little bit further. We don't want to go up too far because we don't want to hinder the movement here of that D ring. Okay, so we're going to look right here on our piece. We're going to be looking at the other side and we're going to make the mark at approximately the same point. We're going to do that right there too. Okay, so that's about right there. So right there is where we're going to punch our holes. Let's bring our hole punch in. We're punching through both of those pieces of metal and we're punching through the cord, both pieces of cord. So I'm holding this here, putting that punch part right where I made that mark and I'm going to squeeze pretty hard going through all four layers so I need to be able to make sure that I go through all four layers. So then I'm going to gently, very gently pull this out of here. And sometimes that's hard because it really likes to stick in there. If need be, you can always take it on pliers and you can do it that way. Okay, so now we're going to take a look. We're just going to make sure that everything turned out okay. When I look at the back, and this has not happened yet to me, this right here did not go all the way through. So what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to come back through here with our hole punch and we're going to need to just punch a little bit harder. And this time, let's bring our pliers in to hold on to this while we remove the hole punch this time. Just making it a little bit easier and we're rocking back and forth so that will release it, its tooth. If for some reason this would not go through a second time, what we could do is punch it over on the other side, but it did go through. But I don't have much going on over here. So what I'm going to be doing is taking my um, the straight side of my cutters here, and I'm going to be coming in and I'm going to be just getting rid of that tab that was left on the back side. Okay, now, what we're going to do is bring in our bead reamer and we're just going to ream this out a little bit so that 16 gauge will fit in there. Right now at this point, I should be able to pull on all of my um, cords and nothing should move. I should pull it, be able to pull on them individually and they don't come out. I can only do that because I have this reamer in here and that's holding everything in place. Do not do that without something pegging that in. Like the bead reamer or like your... Um, your wire here. Here we have 16 gauge wire. I want you to take a look at what I have here. I have the last cut is a pinched cut, meaning it was cut here in the valley. We need to go to the flat side of this cutter and we're going to cut it straight across like that so that what we have is more of a blunt cut. That's going to help us with our rivet. Now what we're going to do is we're going to bring our wire into that hole. If the wire struggles, come back in with your bead reamer and just ream it out a little bit more. I want that to be fairly snug though. So don't, don't uh, think that right away if it doesn't just slide in immediately that you're done. Try to force it just a little bit. Now what we're going to do, I have about a millimeter on one side. I'm going to bring in my cutters on the flush side or the flat side and I'm going to come in and I'm going to cut about a millimeter on the other side. There we go. Maybe that's a little less than a millimeter, but we will be able to make this work, okay? We want both sides to be about even, so I'm just going to push that in so it's even. I'm going to bring in my steel bench block and my riveting hammer. And this right here, the riveting hammer has a flat side and it has kind of a um, pointed side. This right here is fairly weighted. So as I'm riveting, I'm going to be riveting, holding my handle here at the end, letting the weight of the hammer come down on the rivet. That's my goal. Uh, I'm going to zoom up on this so that you can see the rivet, not the actual action that I'm doing here. So what I want you, actually, why don't I go ahead and start showing you this action. We're gonna start off again, we've got even sides of this rivet on either side, and we're going to very gently, very gently, just hammering. I, if, I, if I imagine this as a clock, I'm hammering right now at three and nine o'clock.
Okay, and then I'm going to turn my piece, and then I'm going to ham I'm going to turn it a quarter of a turn, and I'm hammering it now at the three and nine o'clock. Okay, now I'm going to flip it over, and I'm going to do the same on the other side. Again, I'm letting the weight of the hammer speak. I'm going to flip it around, and I'm going to do it again. What I'm doing is I'm splaying out that metal in that 16 gauge wire. Now I'm going to zoom up and just show you what this looks like up closer. Okay, let's go ahead and go back. I just flipped it back over. I'm trying to get it so you can see what I'm doing here. Okay. Coming at it from one angle, and then I'm going to come at it from another angle. Then I'm going to come at it from a diagonal angle. And then let's come at it from the other diagonal angle. You wouldn't want to contort your body. I'm just showing you this in this general direction so that you can see what we're doing here. You would want to move your piece. Let's flip it over the other side. Let's do it again. Riveting is a, a test of patience. You want to be able to just be as gentle as you can in the beginning. If you go for gusto in the beginning, you're not going to be splaying out that end of that wire to create a beautiful rivet. Now we're coming in at a diagonal. Now we're going to come into the other diagonal. The reason why we flip it over from time to time is so that we don't have a, a splaying of the end of the wire on one side and not the other. And we're going to flip it back over. And this side is actually splayed out pretty good. So we're going to go back to the side we just came from and we're going to continue to splay. We're really close to being to the point, getting to the point where we can start using our flat side. Riveting is, is, is a skill. It's a skill I even I'm still trying to master. Now I'm noticing that my D ring is just coming off of that D or that flat area, the D area. Okay, so now we're gonna go with a flatter area and we're just going to gently, again, this is a gentle maneuver to begin with, right on top of that rivet on one side, we're flipping it over, we're gonna do it on top of the other. We're gonna flip it over, we're gonna do it on the other. Okay, as I do this, I'm becoming more and more aggressive. This side, I can tell, needs it a little bit more, so I'm going to just stay with this side. Let's fix our D-ring here. I don't wanna get it to a point where I'm trapping my D-ring in at the wrong side, at the wrong angle. Okay, let's take a look at this and just see how it looks right now. It's a pretty good rivet. We're going to pull. We're going to make sure that everything is all there and ready to go. Now, looking at this, we can see we have a little bit of overhang here. It's a little bit funky over here. What we're going to do is we're going to take our shears and we're just going to clean that up a little bit and or we could take our file and we could just file it down. So I might start off with my shears a little bit, just kind of just nip that off, uh, just, just a hair, just ever so slightly. I'm just gonna nip that off and then I'm going to come in with my file and then I'm going to file it. I, here we go. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is just file that. 
All right, now that I have those ends filed on either side and I'm happier with how it looks as far as evenness, I'm going to come in with my sanding paper and I'm just, or my sanding film, and I'm just gonna sand this. I'm just kind of refining that a little bit. What I did here is I sanded with um, the P20 sanding film. I sanded the ring and I also sanded um, the metal component here and the rivet. I don't wanna to sand too vigorously because if I make that rivet too thin, it is going to lose its structure and it won't be usable. So now we're gonna go ahead and we're going to do the same on the other side. Take a look here, Let's see what we have. We have, yep, these look good. We're good to go for our next step, which is going to be that we're going to prepare, we're going to prepare to put a clasp on. Alrighty, let's go ahead and attach our clasp. I have, uh, here I have two lengths of um, 24 gauge sterling silver wire. These are each eight centimeter in length. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to be creating a secured loop. If you're not familiar with how to create a secure loop, I do have a great video um, on how to create that. So go ahead and go to my YouTube um, channel and check out how to create a secure loop. I am gonna show you here how to, but I'm not going to show you in as depth as I would if um, I were going to be showing you from the start. So what I do is I just bring my um, round nose pliers in and I'm just going to create a loop like so. And I'm going to bring the wire over to the other side. I'm going to adjust here. And I'm going to release that. I'm going to open that up just a little bit. I'm going to place that loop right on my uh, D-ring. I'm going to kind of, using my fingers, I'm just going to close that a little bit. Just kind of pinch that closed a little bit. I'm going to come in here with my chain nose pliers. I like to work at this angle and I just wanted to just show you how I work at this angle. Here we go. And then I'm going to bring my finger, since this wire is 24 gauge, I can use my finger for it. And I'm just creating a coil. And I'm going to create another coil. We can do two to three coils. We just want that to be secured. I really like to use a nice razor, razor flush cutter using the flush side or the flat side. I come in towards the piece and I get as close as I possibly can using the tip of that razor tip. Okay, so now I have that first part or that first secure loop. I do like to kind of take that loop and just kind of straighten everything out a little bit more. And then I'm going to add a three millimeter bead. I've got some corrugated beads here, which I think add just a little bit of interest. So I'm going to add that onto here. There we go. I just added that bead onto there. Now what we're gonna do is we're going to create a loop on the other side. Now I need to be able to ascertain, this is the right side of my um, necklace. So when I put this right side of the necklace, so when I put this on, I'm gonna want, if I'm right-handed, I want the clasp over here. If I'm left-handed, I want the clasp over here. So I'm gonna put the clasp over here. And what I have here is a seven millimeter spring-loaded clasp. And I'm just going to open and close that just to make sure it works. Not all of your clasp that you order, especially in bulk, are gonna be working. I speak from experience. So what we're going to do is we're going to be coming in here again and we're going to be creating another loop to do another secured loop. I love these secured loops because I know that they're not going to go anywhere. Now I leave a little bit of a gap because remember I did that coil here on this side. I'm going to be doing a coil here on the other side. So I just kind of bend that over. I create a loop here and over and I'm going to open up that loop a little bit and I'm going to put that clasp on. I'm right-handed. Uh, most likely I'll be wearing this necklace. If not, I hopefully, whoever is gonna be wearing it will be right-handed. So I put this on and then I'm going to close that loop that I just made. And I'm going to, it's a combination of just using my fingernail and also using the chain nose pliers. Now that gap that I left, 
I can grab hold the end of my wire and I can create another set of coils on that side. I'm going to come in here with my cutters and I'm going to cut those off. Now, if there's if it looks like it's poking out a little bit, which sometimes it does, what I do is I take the tip of my chain nose pliers and I just roll it around. Because it's on a round wire, if I roll it around, that's what I want. So, okay, so now I have the clasp, it's attached. I thought I would do something a little bit special for the other side. And for the other side, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create kind of an adjustable chain. In order to do that, I've, I have a sterling silver chain here that has large links. I need to make sure that these large links will fit onto the spring-loaded clasp. By that, I mean, does it, first of all, will the gap that's in this go into the gap or the um, actual chain? The other thing is, is there enough hole in that chain for that to pass through? So uh, this is about an inch. I could have made it longer if I would have wanted to, but I was conserving on my chain, so I did this about an inch. So there's a little bit of room here. This is, so I'm making this into a, um, a bit of a choker. It's not gonna be a choker choker, but if I wanted to make it into a choker, I would just make this part here, um, the strap, I would just make it shorter. So, okay, let's go ahead and create another secure loop on the opposite side. All right, now that we have the secure loop on the other D-ring, and I've not actually secured this top part yet. I need to be able to keep it open because now what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert the end of the um, extender chain right in there. There we go. And I'm going to bring in my pliers. I'm going to pinch that and I'm going to create another set of coils. And I'm going to cut and tuck. All right. Here we have our clasp, which can go, it can actually go on here. We can open this up and we can put this on here. Or we can open this up and we can put it on any place along the chain, making this longer, making this uh, not so much a choker, but more of a um, uh, more of a, just a necklace. So what I want to point out to you is that I, I don't tend to be able to stop just there. What we're going to do is we're going to create a little plaque that says fly and because we have the wings here. I thought that would be really fun. So let's go ahead and let's do that. Okay, let's start to have some fun with some stamping. Um, I'm going to be using um, Metal Stamps by Impress Art. This is the Lollipop set. And I like these because if you take a look at the letters, they're a little bit elongated and they have just kind of a funky look to them. Maybe like a lollipop, like they're on a lollipop stick. These right here, um, we're just using the F, L, and the Y here. And I'm going to put that in order. Now, when you stamp these, if you take a look, your um, uh, your branding is located towards you. So is the um, stamp. Now, the stamp will be upside down. The letter will be upside down. But you know that you're in the correct position in order to stamp that when you go to stamp that. So what I do is I put my F, my L, and my Y there so that I know that I am going to not mess up and put that out of order. First thing I'm going to do is take a little piece of um, painter's tape. It's this blue low tech paint and I'm just, or paint, uh, tape, and I'm going to put that on there. And the other thing that I'm going to do is going to be putting another piece of tape right here. I'm, what I'm, my gunning for is I'm gunning to just, you know, make it about, put it in about that far. So, and I'm going to do that here and I want that to be straight. There's one piece, and I like to go ahead and put another piece on there. And the reason for this is that I know then where to stop my um, stamps when I start to stamp. I need a ledge in order to ascertain that. So that right there becomes my line for stamping. I'm gonna start off by picking up my F 
and I am going, by the way, I'm going to be using a two pound brass uh, mallet hammer. And I like the brass because as you see, it's um, it allows you to actually bite into the um, stamp. Whereas if you use steel, steel against steel, well, one, it, you know, it can break and the other, it can, um, it, it, it doesn't bite into it and push it down in like the way it does. You also have a lot of weight here with this brass. So this right here is a better option. It doesn't bounce off of it. It goes, it stamps, it takes on some of that blow or that velocity. Okay, so let's go ahead again. We've got the F. I'm gonna just zoom up on this so you can see what I'm doing. We've got the F here. We're bringing that F in so it's facing us. And we're going to place it on the metal and then we're going to slide it down. We're sliding it down until just until it hits that paper or it hits that tape. Once it hits that tape, what we're going to do is we're going to bring in our mallet and I'm holding this in. I've got my pinky resting on the block. I've got three fingers on the back of this uh, stamp and I've got my thumb up front. I'm going to give it a couple of good thwacks. And then I'm going to release it. I have my F that's in place. The next thing I'm going to do is bring in my L and I'm going to do the same. I'm going to take my stamp, I'm going to eyeball it just to see about where I need to place that. And I'm going to say about right there. Once it starts to hit the tape, I don't go any further. I just stay right there. I hold onto my stamp the same way and I bring in my hammer and a couple of thumps and now I'm going to do the same with the Y if you notice this is curling up a little bit don't worry about how it's curling up we're gonna deal with that here in a little bit we're bringing in our Y just until it meets the tape once it meets the tape we're gonna give it a couple of thumps and there we have our fly so let's go ahead and fly and get this on there. We can remove our tape and be able to make sure that I leave room on either side for a hole. So I'm going to go ahead and cut this down. Again, this is a personal preference. If you want to, you can make it smaller, which I am going to make it smaller, or you can make it larger. Just going to make that a little bit smaller. I can also round the edges off just by simply cutting them down. Once I get to a point where I think it looks fairly even, then I just kind of stop. I think we're pretty good there. Now, the problem that we have here, if we take a look at that, that's kind of curled up, right? Well, we don't want that to be curled up. So what I do is if you have a second bench block, come in with that bench block and just smack it down. And that will flatten that up there. If you don't, you can use your uh, pliers and you can squeeze it and you can mold it. Now this is just, you know, this is 26 gauge. So it's really, you're not, you're not going to have a problem with this. Okay. So, but I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to show you this little technique, especially if you're going to be working with a 20 gauge or something a little bit higher. So I went ahead and I just smack that down. I'm going to just, just ever, 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 just, just a little bit. I'm going to just nip off those ends. I'm going to do this, just nip off those ends. And then I'm going to file all these edges all the way around. And then I'm going to put my holes on either side. sanded off those edges, just kind of rounded off those corners. Now I'm going to come in with a Sharpie or a primer marker and I'm just going to fill in the FLY. I'm noticing that the L just jumped a little bit here. So it looks like F jump, um, F, F, L, Y, like F jump, Y. I like that. 
just gives it more of a bouncy feel to it. Okay, now what we're gonna do, now that we've filled in our fly, we're gonna come in here with our three P320 uh, sanding film, and we're just going to sand off uh, those areas where the um, marker landed. I also want to just kind of finish off that edge there or the front. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we are going to be putting in our holes in either side. So I've got a hole here and we're going to let me get my marker started again. Got a hole we're going to put here and we're going to put a hole here. in there. Let's bring in our round nose pliers and create a secured loop. Attach it to the fly. And we're going to hold on to that here. Just going to just create a little bit of a coil here. Now I thought it might be a little bit fun if we add a little bling to this. Just a little bit. Let's not go overboard here. We're gonna I'm going to add a little amethyst. So we are going to put that on the other side where the other hole is. But before we do that, we're going to go ahead and we are going to add a little corrugated bead just like we did earlier into our fly. This is this not just the most fun little necklace. It's just the whole the whole process has just been very enjoyable for for me to create. It's actually been a while since I have been creating any jewelry. I've been working on um, some watercolors and just, you know, just I'm always kind of trying to uh, work and, you know, on that creative side of the brain. And just, I find that working that, you know, that side of the brain really helps me in other areas. So you'll find that I frequently flop from, you know, from project to project maybe a little ADD, but it is really enjoyable for me to have all these different interests that I have. I always come back to um, metals though. So here we go. Got that secure loop on. I'm going to just do my little tucking business here. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna add that little bit of bling, but what I'm noticing is that this right here is just a little bit on the sharp side, this little um, hole. So I'm going to be bringing in my file and I'm just going to be just filing off that, that burr. Okay, so what I have here is I have um, uh, a head pin. You can create your own, which I believe I created this one, or you can purchase them. And with this one, we're going to go ahead, we're going to create a secure loop. And you want this loop to be just a little bit bigger because it's gonna be coming up and around over here. So we're just going to create a loop, a little bit of a baker loop. I believe this head pin is a 22 gauge. And I put that in there and I just allow it to fall back to the other side. And I'm going to hold on here with my chain nose pliers and we're going to create one, two, three, however many will fit in there, four. Four fit in there that time. 
four little coils. And we're going to cut. We are so close to done. I'm so excited to see this finished. We have our finished choker. It's definitely within the season here in the Midwest. Um, and I live in the Midwest. I live in the Chicago area. And uh, we have a lot of cicadas in our, in our area. A plethora of them, as a matter of fact. So um, this right here is to celebrate the 17-year cicadas, which have emerged here in our state here in the Midwest. I really appreciate you joining me here. I would love to see what you created using any parts of what we used here today, whether it's riveting, whether you made this um, choker part here, whether you used the cicada wing, maybe you created something totally different. Maybe you didn't use the cicada wing. Maybe you didn't add the fringe, whatever you do. I'm on Instagram. If you could please tag me on Instagram, if you make anything and you post a picture and just say, hey, you know, uh, learn this from Susan, you know, from Wired Lotus's uh, tutorial. I would love to see your work. That really thrills me. Actually, I don't see enough of it and I would love to see more of it. So please, if you will, tag me on Instagram. I would really appreciate it. I'll acknowledge it. I will. I will. And if not, just, hey, nudge me again, will you? Hey, thank you so much for joining me. This was an awesome project. Bye-bye, everybody.